Ah, uh, friends, I just pressed the let's go live uh, button. So let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internet before we go ahead and get started and get nice and situated right here in the frame. On this beautiful Friday, we made it through another week. Let's make sure the tubes are connected before we jump into the program today, my friends. It looks like we are alive and well. That's tremendous news. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney. And today, we are talking about Donald Trump's classified document bombshell. He's saying, actually, it's not just documents, it's testimony. He's saying that in trial, when we get there in March of 2024, the day before Super Tuesday, that Trump is going to be using classified materials, classified information at trial to show that there were some very serious problems with the 2020 election, and not only 2020, but also 2016, saying that he's got you know reports showing that there was foreign interference, as well as biases that were embedded within our intelligence agencies. So in other words, Trump got bad data and he decided to act against that data and he's allowed to do that under the American Constitution. So he filed a notice saying, you you guys better get ready for this. And so there's a bunch of people over at the FBI and the CIA that are like, oh crap. So we'll see what Trump says. We also have a clarification on this Mark Meadows story, right? We got this one coming out. This was a big uh, repost thing happening yesterday on the X platform. But Mark Meadows, I think, is not what others were saying he was. There was a retraction on the allegation that he was wearing a wire, and we were kind of skeptical about that. And apparently, it's not true. So Mark Meadows' lawyer made a statement, so I want to make sure we read that so we can get that out there. And the retraction came over from the person who originally broke the story, Ryan Fournier. And so he posted an apology and the retraction. And Jim Jordan was also brought in on this. And he says, I know Mark Meadows, all right? Mark Meadows is not doing any of this. So we'll just clear that up. We've also got this filing from the media. They want access to the January 6th trial. And we were talking with Viva today about some of this. So we had a great uh, uh, conversation with Viva, our friend Viva Fry over on Rumble, over on YouTube, over next door on Locals at uh, vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Had a great conversation with him this morning about cameras in the courtroom and all sorts of other activity that was happening there. And so the media, they want access to the January 6th courtroom. And we'll see what happens. I want to just go through the order or the motion very quickly that was filed by this media consolidated media group. They're all getting together and say, but let us have cameras in the courtroom. And I absolutely want cameras in the courtroom. Trump doesn't have to file a response to this, but the judge has asked for his opinion. And so we'll see if he does. And then we've got a clip over from Weissman, who I think is properly identifying what Trump is doing, right? I think this is a strategy. And we've been talking about Trump here flexing maximum wingspan, right? Opening up those wingspan and just using his free speech to the maximum ability. And if that leads to a head with the Department of Justice and the due process clause, well, so be it. That's just how it is. That's what happens when you bring charges against your political opponents in America. We have uh, you know, reasons why we don't do that in this country, but we'll listen to what Wiseman has to say about it and unpack that. Then we'll turn over to a couple of motions that came in back to back. We've already talked about here the Trump motion to dismiss the January 6th case based on presidential immunity, right? We've got a lot of issues, constitutional violations, statutory violations, vindictive and selective prosecution, but we've also got presidential immunity. That's a whole separate reason why this whole case should be dumped into the garbage. And so Trump filed his original motion. We read through that in detail. And as we know, Trump as the moving party gets the last word. So he filed the motion. Jack Smith submitted a 54 page response. We'll just take a quick look at that. And then we'll look at Trump's reply to Jack Smith's response. So Trump goes first, Jack Smith second, then Trump goes third. And because Trump goes third, he's going to incorporate a lot of the things from Jack Smith's response in his reply. So we'll just skip forward and read the reply. We've also then got a clip from Bill Barr. Bill Barr is going to be talking about Trump and about retribution, as though what's happening to Trump right now is not retribution to him. And then we're going to jump into our final segment, which is going to be talking about Joe Biden. 
in that big, fat $200,000 check that came into his bank account as a so-called loan repayment, All right, from Sarah and James Biden, $200,000, dumped over into Joe's account March 1st. Well, James Comer's got questions about that, of course, so does uh, America, uh, but not the FBI, they don't care. Comer had some questions, so he brought this up over when he was talking with Just the News. And then we've also got the White House counsel getting a letter from James Comer and the Oversight Committee. So Comer says, you guys better answer some questions about this. We see that this transaction happened. Did it show up in your taxes or can you explain what this was for? Because it looks kind of problematic. And then Comer sent in a letter over to Jamie Raskin and he's demanding that Raskin issue an apology for being so wrong. And we'll see if Raskin complies. But my friends, as you can see, we've got a lot to get to today. We are grateful that you are here and with us. It is a beautiful Friday. We had a very busy week and we've got a couple of items on the agenda left. We're not done yet. And so as you can see, we've got stuff to get to. We will be here after the show for a debrief with our friends, our members at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We would love to see you there. We had a members only live chat going on when we were talking with Viva this morning. Then we did a members only stream this morning. So you've already missed the stream if you weren't a member, sorry. And we do after parties for our members and we do Saturday shows. So we'll be talking to you tomorrow if you're a member at watchingthewatchers.locals.com or you can become a member on YouTube and get a lot of the same stuff except the after party. You gotta join us on Telegram. So grab the Telegram link on the community tab section over on YouTube. And now we've got robertgovea.com is our website. You can read all of the reports. If you click over here, you can sign up for our newsletter. So just click this button, boom, a form will pop up, sign up for our newsletter. So you get all of these reports. We're having every video segment turned into reports. So you can read a summary of it in case you can't watch the full thing. And we got the PDFs, all right, up on the website. Okay, so we put all the PDFs on the website. So go check out Robert Govea. Dot com so you can read through these things at your leisure if you want to get the actual documents that we cover here on the screen. All right, and so without any further ado, my friends, it is time to get right into it. And we're starting with the big classified documents revealed or the big classified strategy revealed, which is what we've been waiting for for some time. Donald Trump's defense drops a bombshell right into Judge Chutkin and Jack Smith's lap saying that, hey, When this case goes to trial on March 3rd, conveniently right before Super Tuesday, right in the middle of an election season, Trump says, we'll be ready to go and we're coming in hot. We're coming in with classified evidence. And this evidence is going to show that Trump was totally and justified to do what he did, which was to investigate a rigged election. And so we're going to go through that motion in detail. It's not long because it's classified. There's a lot of classified materials in there that Trump's defense can't really talk about. So we'll take a look at what they submitted and why the FBI and probably the CIA are all quaking in their boots over there. Oh, great. What's he going to talk about? And so we're going to go through that. Then we'll clear up this Mark Meadows story because Mark Meadows' lawyer had a response. There was a rumor going around that he was wearing a wire in the Oval Office. And that's, of course, not true as we're finding out at this point. And we've also got some interesting filings from the media. They want access to all of this, right? So when Chutkin and Jack Smith bring in their trial and when Trump uses this classified material stuff to talk about what's happening, the media wants to be able to broadcast that. And boy, oh boy, wouldn't that be nice to have America be able to see it and be able to review what Trump presents? So we'll take a look at what the media says about it. We'll also see what Trump says, whether he responds to this, whether he agrees to cameras or not is to be seen. And then we'll listen to what Wiseman said because he's articulately saying the same thing we've been saying here, that Trump is doing the free speech dance, right? He's really exercising this almost to go the DOJ. And so let's start off with the motion. It is not long, but this one is packing a punch. That's why we wanna see it because here it comes, pretty simple. And sometimes simplicity is what you need. It's a three pager. And what is this blue pen? Let's bring out the red and let's girth the pen up a bit, perfect. So here, filed in the District of Columbia, United States of America versus Donald Trump. Pretty simple filing, only three pages. The clerk's like, oh, this shouldn't be a big deal. Well, guess what? This is President Trump's SEPA notice and objection to unauthorized deletions of classified information. So boom, notice, right? We're notifying you, everybody, 
this is our plan and this is the route we're going. So get ready, buckle up. They say a uh, judge in Jack Smith. On October 26, 2023, President Trump's counsel, his lawyers provided to the classified information security officer. And remember, we're in the District of Columbia right now, but there are classified documents in this case. I know there is a separate Florida case that also is based about classified documents and classified materials, but that is not the case we're talking about. Just to completely distinguish the two of them. We're in DC. This is the January 6th case, not about the Mar-a-Lago boxes at all. But in the DC case, there is also classified documents. Okay, they said that as part of discovery, Trump's team and his lawyers also have to go through the SEPA proceedings and the procedures to get cleared and everything. It should be quick because they're getting cleared in Florida and so on. So we're also having some complexities with classified documents and materials here. But Trump's people are saying, this is in addition to that. They say here, we've provided to the security officer and for submission to the court and service on counsel, a notice pursuant to the SIPA rules and an objection to certain redactions in certain of the classified discovery produced by special counsel's office. So two things happening here. One, notification, okay? The rules say that we've got to notify you if we do something like this. And two, Jack Smith, the special counsel, they gave us a bunch of this classified discovery, okay? And they redacted all the stuff that we need, right? We got these big tranches of documents and it's just all, you know, blacked out. They're ridiculous. So we object to these redactions. And we're also giving you notice about our intention. So Trump's defense says, Chuck, at the beginning of this month, Jack Smith's office, they came into this courtroom and they argued, they said the classified discovery issues in this case are quote limited and tangential and narrow and quote incidental because the charges do not rely on classified materials. Again, we're in DC, we're not in Florida. So they're saying Trump's so-called insurrection, you know, the charges they're actually charging him with are not that. But they say that those are not based on classified materials, and so we're not too concerned about SEPA and those things. But Trump says, uh-uh, no, sorry. They say through the SEPA notice, President Trump demonstrates that the government appears to have looked with tunnel vision at limited issues it believed were relevant. They had that opinion. They came to their conclusion. They said, well, we think that, you know, Jack Smith's looking at all the materials. He's looking at all the charges. And he says, you know, Trump only needs, needs this subset of classified materials because this is how we're structuring our case. And we think this is what he needs. But Trump's defense says, sorry, your little theory that means that you believe that Classified materials are limited is wrong. Sorry, classified issues are not limited. They're not tangential. They're not narrow. Their office was wrong, they said. It's not much longer to go. This is Todd Blanche writing, saying, the indictment from Jack Smith in this case, deranged thug prosecutors, adopts classified assessments by the intelligence community and others that minimized and at times ignored efforts by foreign actors to influence and interfere with the 2020 election. And so President Trump will offer classified information at trial relating to foreign influence activities that impacted the 2016 and 2020 elections, as well as efforts by his administration to combat those very activities. President Trump will also present classified information relating to the biased and politicized nature of the intelligence assessments that he and others rejected during the course of the events in question. Saying collectively, this evidence will undercut central theories of the prosecution, Jack Smith's entire case, and establish that President Trump acted at all times in good faith and on the belief that he was doing what he had been elected to do. Sincerely, your friend Todd Blanche and John Laura. So good stuff. Now, very short, but very powerful here. Okay, they're saying that Jack Smith believed that they had everything they need in this case without talking about classified materials. And Trump is saying, well, if you're going to go into my state of mind and you're going to try to tell me as the president 
that I was acting knowingly fraudulently, right? That I knew that I had lost the election. I believe that and I knew it, but I was trying to steal the election anyways. Trump is saying, no, not at all. Okay, that's not the truth at all. In fact, Jack Smith adopts assessments that minimized and ignored foreign actor assessments. Okay, they're, they're reading things in a way that serves them. But Trump knows the truth. Trump has classified information from his perspective that he also got that said, sorry, these elections were rigged and there were efforts. And so he's gonna present his side of the story as well. And once you see that side of the story, you're gonna recognize that Trump was obviously justified in his belief that this was rigged. And we know it was now because of what the 51 so-called intelligence ex experts did when they colluded literally with Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, who was working for the Bidens at the time, what they did on X, what they did with social media censoring people, they have gone out of their way to move past that. But we can all see it now as clear as day. Not to mention all the COVID rule changes and the constitutional violations that happened when the executives, like the secretaries of state, usurped the, the legislatures and took away the constitutional power from them by recreating the election rules in the pretext of COVID pandemonium. So this is the motion, very simple. And this is gonna be very curious how this goes because Trump has, in my opinion, an absolute right to present this evidence. And the jury, right, they all, they're all gonna be a jury of his peers, so they're gonna be listening to this evidence and the media, they want to be broadcasting this evidence. And so how are they going to finagle all of this? Well, as we can see, we're going to continue to cover it. Now, we're going to go to the media and their desire for access. But before we get there, let's clear up this Mark Meadows story, because this is also an interesting subtext of a lot of this, right? Classified materials, are there moles? What else is coming out? Are people flipping? What is this case going to look like? Well, there was a rumor out there that Mark Meadows was wearing a wire, right? That he was being uh, colluded with the FBI to go and tap the Oval Office and so on. Well, it turns out that story has been denied by Mark Meadows and his defense team. And it didn't have a, the right feel to it when we first listened to it yesterday. But Catherine Herridge also came out and said the following, said, here's the statement from Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, the lawyer for him. His name is George Terwilliger. He says, when the government identified Mark as a prospective witness, Mark Meadows committed to telling the truth and only the truth. Time and time again, he sought to protect presidential privilege and testified when the law required him to do so. Stories claiming to have knowledge of a deal or that he has some form of animus towards President Trump have zero idea what they're talking about, and he will not be intimidated by anyone. All right, that's from, from George Terwilliger, Meadows' lawyer. And you know we were cautious with this story when it originally broke because it didn't feel right because Mark Meadows, as we've seen here, has been fighting pretty hard, actually. I mean, he fought very aggressively when he was trying to get his case in the RICO case with Big Fanny removed up into the federal court system. And we've seen even Trump come out and kind of stand behind Mark Meadows. So, you know, I think some of these rumors are off. And so I don't know exactly how this story got percolated. I do know that uh, it originated largely from this guy yesterday. He got his tweet or his breaking of the story was really what caught a lot of attention. He has since deleted that tweet and he has now published this. He says, yesterday, I put up a tweet alleging that Mark Meadows wore a wire in the White House during the last stretch. I've spoke with my sources again. Now it seems the information was wrong and incorrect. In fact, two of them retracted their statements on the matter entirely. Now, I apologize for putting something out without it not being 100% accurate. That's on me. I'll do better next time. I also apologize to Congressman Meadows and his staff for having to field questions on the issue. There seem to be some dark forces behind the scenes trying to get Meadows. And to me, that's very problematic, especially when it seems like it's been sent through the grapevines by some of our own. And you can see this has gotten a lot of play, right? 1.7 million views here is a lot. And this is the apology. This is the retraction. The other tweet got a lot. So we were asking about the sources, right? Who is promoting this stuff and who's trying to cause some of this division? Because I have some concerns about this, my friends. I, I think that it is not a good tactic to 
try to drive these potential witnesses out of the Trump camp, however you want to define that. You know, whether it's Powell, Sidney Powell, Kenneth Chesterbro, Jenna Ellis, Mark Meadows, Rudy, anybody. The idea is we're all friends, okay, until they give you a hard reason not to, you know, not to, to trust them or something. We, you know, it's better to keep them close as much as we can. And so I want to be cognizant that, you know, anytime something like this happens, my, my original instinct, my initial instinct is going to be, okay, maybe they're, you know, how can we salvage this? Because what we absolutely do not want to happen with Meadows or any of these people is what basically what happened with Cassidy Hutchinson. And Cassidy Hutchinson turned into a big problem because we saw some text messages that we covered here. It sounded like she was reaching out looking for help from the right side and she couldn't find it. And so where did she end up running right into the bosom of Benny Thompson and Liz Cheney and Kinzinger, his giant bosoms. So she was there, right? And she was up there, clavicle, clavicle, clavicle attack, clavicle attack, because she was, she was sort of captured by the other side. So I want to be very careful about this. And I know a lot of people are upset about the plea deals being taken and all this stuff. But until we see something concrete, I think the smarter play is to keep potential witnesses, adverse witnesses in the fold. But he says this, right? And so, so my, my, my point is, who is the person who is spreading these claims? He says, I'd also say this. Now, I have no clue if the original source in terms of the knowledge, if he's the original source, Walker's a good man. Don't get me wrong. I think a lot of people got lied to again. I'm sorry. All right. So he apologized. We don't need to belabor that anymore. But the, you know, the question was who, who was promoting that? And are those same forces promoting other uh, fractures within this, within this journey that these cases are on? So that was the clarification on that. So, you know, if we see stuff like that pop up, we're just going to keep our eyes on it and be ultra skeptical on it until we see some filings. That's generally why we like to wait for filings and for some court activity, because otherwise it's just kind of rumor and speculation. But when this was breaking, they were asking Jim Jordan about it. And so even Jim Jordan's like, I don't think this has any legs to it. And rumor, there's been reports. There's been a lot of scuttlebutt that Mark Meadows, um, former chief of staff to, to Trump, may have, at one point I read, may have worn a wire while he was chief of staff. I know Mark very well. You know Mark, you're good friends. I just don't believe any of this. Do you know anything about this? Has he turned on Trump? Can you tell us what you know? I don't, uh, but I, do, I, I don't believe anything that gets written about, about you know, uh, from the from so many people in the mainstream press. I don't believe Mark would do that. I, I, Mark's, a, Mark's a good friend, but I don't know. But I, I trust that Mark, Mark thinks the world of President Trump, as do I, and I know you do as well, Eric. I want him to be our next president. I think Mark's the same place, uh, and Mark is a good man. So I don't believe what the press writes about him. I will. I will. All right, so I think I agree with that. And that's kind of been my take with a lot of these people is that maybe they're no longer, you know, ultra MAGA as to use a Biden term or something like that, but they're still, you know, they still are on, you know, they believed what they were doing. You know, I don't think that Sidney Powell or Jenner Ellis or Kenneth Chesserbro or Mark Meadows or anybody thought that they were criminals, that they were going out there to insurrect America and to do this racketeering scheme to go and take over the country. Like that was never anybody's intention. That's all a fiction from the left that they've got created to give themselves nightmares every night, you know? So here, the reality is, you know, Mark Meadows, what's he going to say? Yeah, we thought the election was rigged. I had some disagreements with Trump, but it, it didn't feel right. So we just want to keep an eye on that and make sure that that's clear. And I think the better strategy until we have concrete evidence that something is really awry, keep people in the fold. And then if they turn, then you can, then you can cross-examine them and then obliterate them and say, well, didn't you say this in your book? Weren't you tweeting this like three months ago? Didn't you say this on CNN too about how you thought it was rigged? Right? All of these people are subject to cross-examination and they can live with their own records, which have all been supportive of Trump for a very long time. So, all right, enough on, out, out of me on that one. Now, the media certainly wants to hear about this and so do we and I'm very excited about this you know they said that we were going to get uh, a lot of camera activity we've gotten some camera activity out of Big Fanny's case in Georgia the Rico case Trump of course is not scheduled for trial on that one until who knows when but then we've got two federal cases where we are not allowed traditionally to have any media access in federal court the media wants access to it of course so do we and so let's see what they filed when they were demanding access. And did I open this up? Hang on a second. 
boom. This is the coalition, the media coalition. Okay, they want access. They want to see all of this stuff. And I would like to see it too. I think that it should be public because this is one of the most important issues in the political cycle, arguably American history, because it, it dictates the future of really the justice system and whether politics can be subject to criminal prosecution on the whims of a special counsel or a fanny. So here is what the latest looks like. Now, this was filed some time ago, but Trump has just been ordered to issue a response if he wants to. And so the judge is now taking this under consideration as of now, saying that in 23 pages, we'll just hit the highlights of it. They say, look, all these people, all the media, and I, I'm with them, let's see it. They say here, ABC, AP, Bloomberg, Wall Street, CNN, uh, National Photographers, Politico, okay, everybody, Washington, blah, blah, blah. They say here, we respectfully submit application to record and to telecast the March 2024 trial of Trump. Alternatively, the media coalition respectfully requests that the court publish on YouTube its internally administered audiovisual live stream and recordings of the proceedings. Yeah, just put it on the YouTubes and we'll stream it here. As a final alternative, so let us get in there with cameras and broadcast or take your current feed and put it up, or release the video recordings after each day when the case is done. Now, they say as the, we'll just hit the highlights on this. Now, as the US Supreme Court observed over four decades ago, First Amendment right for public to attend criminal trials. Say, it's important that we can see what's going on here. The prosecution of Trump, now a presidential contender, on charges of subverting the electoral process, whatever that means, presents the strongest possible circumstances for the continuous public oversight of the system. Now that oversight rooted in decades of First Amendment protection and through counsel, through lawyers, Trump has repeatedly spoken out about the importance of cameras in the courtroom. For his benefit, Trump wants them, and that of the court, they say real-time video coverage will be critical in stemming false conspiracy theories across the entire spectrum of public opinion, regardless of the trial's outcome. Which I agree with, yeah, let's see it. Because I think Trump's defense is much stronger than their case. I think we're gonna see a recreation of the January 6th committee hearings, except this time, we're gonna have some cross-examination and some opposing witnesses and some alternative theories. So if you thought the January 6th hearings were a joke, well, they're going to be made to look like a big joke when there's actual process there. Because that was basically the research project from Liz Cheney. She put a, get together a book report and gave it over to Jack. So they say, now, Your Honor, listen, we know there's Rule 53, okay? And the federal rules of criminal procedure and there's a local rule. Now, I'm going to ask you guys what you think about this. Do you think that Trump is going to respond? It's going to be the first question. Trump is going to respond yes or no. He doesn't have to respond, as we'll see. Is he going to say, I agree, cameras in the courtroom, respond, I don't agree? And then what is Chucking going to do? Is she going to grant them or not grant them? And if she does not grant them, what is the justification going to be? So be thinking about that when we get there. So the rules on their face create a, pro, a per se prohibition. Okay, it's blanket. I've read it prohibition on the broadcast of criminal proceedings to those unable to attend in person. Now, even though those rules exist, the First Amendment, they say, is stronger. And to be meaningful in the unique circumstances of this case, which is incredible, right? Even the media acknowledges, like, this is historic, this is novel, this is incredible, never before in the, in the history of this country ever seen like it. And then uh, Judge Chutkin's like, well, it's just a regular case. We'll see you in court. You're just like any other regular defendant and you're gagged too. Shut up. Wild. So they say that that right must include a right of firsthand observation. Now, while other federal courts have not yet recognized a First Amendment right to telecast criminal trials, the Supreme Court has not squarely addressed this issue for some time and the D.C. Circuit has not either. And because your rules and your per se bans are outdated and their long disproven views you say, those are unpersuasive here. This is historic and unprecedented. 
I'm really glad the media agrees with Trump's defense on this, by the way. Trump has said the same thing. And Jack Smith's just like, no, no, he's just like a regular criminal, a uh, regular criminal. Uh, you know, just treat him like whatever. Those rules simply cannot justify restricting the public's right to view. A per se ban is unconstitutional here. And so the media coalition respectfully asks that Americans can see and hear the trial and other proceedings in real time, as is their right. Now, here's a quick background. They say, following the election, Joe Biden was elected, and then President Trump refused to concede, said the election was rigged, and said there was tremendous voter fraud and irregularities. All true. On January, hours before the joint session, Trump took to the stage, some armed with weapons and wearing full tactical gear, like water bottles, yeah, marched to the Capitol along with Ray Epps and violently broke into the building with uh, at, least, at least 50 CHSs that we know that the FBI or Homeland Security had there. Now, Trump was impeached and acquitted for incitement of insurrection the following week. Five-day trial, Trump, of course, was acquitted. Proceedings were televised. And that basically invalidates this entire criminal prosecution because he was not actually convicted in the Senate. So all of this is illegitimate. We'll see if the Supreme Court agrees, but that's my opinion. So the proceedings were televised. 11 million viewers watched it. House of Representatives initiated its own investigation. That's Liz Cheney's hearing. 20 million people watched it the first day, and then it dropped off because it was very boring. So they say the indictment came out and it had a bunch of things saying Trump knowingly made false claims about fraud, right? Knowingly made false claims, which he's going to say, no, there's classified documents. I'm going to show you that I had a good basis to believe it. That's why I believed it. So the indictment asserts four felony counts, uh, <laughs> felony counts, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of an official proceeding, and conspiracy against rights, 18 U.S. Code 241. They say trial in this case is scheduled to begin on March 4th, the day before Super Tuesday, when everybody's going to go vote in the primaries. Incredible, isn't it? They say it's unclear at this point how many members of the press and the public will be permitted to appear in trial. The media says, recognizing there's limited physical access to this thing, Trump's lawyer has publicly called for televised proceedings noting that the public should be able to weigh the evidence against itself. I agree. Says, if I appear in court, I'm going to be representing not only the president, but the sovereign citizens of this country who deserve to hear the truth. The first thing we would ask for is let's have cameras in the courtroom so that all Americans can see what's happening in our criminal justice system. And I would hope that the DOJ would join in on that effort and that we can and take that curtain away and let all Americans get to see what's happening. And if they don't, then, you know, obviously we're going to be going through the trial transcripts here to make sure this is etched in the digital space as best as we can. But that's absolutely right. Now, this leads me to believe that this will not obviously be granted because if Trump wants you to see what is happening, you can infer that the government is not. And so you can come to your own conclusions about why that might be. But let's save that for a, a bit. Now, in contrast to federal courts, Georgia State Court has announced that they will be televised. And of course, we've been following all of those here. So they give us their argument. They say what happens in the courtroom is, pu is public property. Other cases involving other cases, we found that the press and the public have a constitutional right to access the trials. Meaningful access is, you know, they're going to make their case here. They're, they're probably going to be stretching. Meaningful access is the right. And so the rationales for criminal proceedings have particular resonance in this case because a polarized electorate includes tens of millions of people who, according to opinion polls, still believe that 2020 was decided by fraud. This is a June 2020 poll. Here's what the numbers say. Three in 10 Americans, 30% of us, shout out to our friends out there, including two thirds of Republicans believe that Joe Biden only won the presidency because of fraud. The rationale for this is that more people who voted for Trump believe this. They say a lack of openness can lead to distrust of the judicial system. Absolutely. Doing all of this under the dark of night, particularly if the outcome is unexpected. 
Now, openness enhances the basic fairness, and there can be no dispute that the public, we the people, have a constitutional right to access these proceedings. And I completely agree with the media here. It should be meaningful access, okay? Not Judge Chutkin coming out and saying, well, somebody can go sit in the media room if they want to. You know, well, well, all of us, all 81 million Americans can go sit and watch it? No. So they say, here, Your Honor, the right of access is grounded in the First Amendment and it's more than theoretical. In a case like this, as a practical matter, it's going to affect literally hundreds of millions of people. And the right must mean more than limiting access to the fit a few into a small courtrooms. Historical tradition of meaningful access means it's got to be meaningful. Here's a historical thing. They say it is telling that after former Vice President Aaron Burr was arrested for treason, in 1807, at the order of Thomas Jefferson, the president, Chief Justice John Marshall decided to move the trial to a much larger hall in the Virginia House of Delegates in Richmond to accommodate the high turnout, allowing those of the public who wanted to attend the opportunity to do so. Okay, so they moved a whole trial into a bigger location to accommodate the public. As a result, thousands of people thronged into the courthouse to see and hear the proceedings. More than two centuries later, no legislative hall is capable of taking in all of the Trumpers who want to see it and everybody else, all the lefties who are salivating over it. So they say remote and virtual attendance is consistent with our tradition. We saw the George Floyd case was televised. The state court for Derek Chauvin was televised. And they came up with a conclusion, and so you should do the same thing here. They say it logically serves the interest of justice. And they're giving us a couple of other examples. Let's see what else is in here. They say now, live streaming and TV are everywhere. Technology has evolved that the presence of a camera in a courtroom is totally unobtrusive. It's not going to bother anybody. Just let us set up a camera right around the corner in the back there. They say many Americans now expect to see the recordings and recognize that we should. So it's not going to be unobtrusive. The simple presence of an unobtrusive thing is not going to be a problem. The means exist today to make this happen. Now, 17 years ago, there were some other rulings, but a lot has changed since that time. And so this trial should be televised. Now, if you're not going to allow us to televise it, then you should allow us to publish the live streams on YouTube right here. During the COVID emergency, we know that your court utilized equipment to publish stuff on hearings, to publish stuff on live streams. So posting these on YouTube so that we can live stream it here, you know, said it would profoundly increase the number of members who could watch the streams. Alternatively, the court records audio and video transcripts, and so you should just publish those. They say, Chutkin, we have never in the history of our nation had a federal criminal trial that warrants audiovisual access more than the federal prosecution of President Trump. Agreed. The central purpose of the constitutional right of access that here governs is to ensure fair trials and to promote confidence in the justice system. But they know if they show us what happens in there, we will have less, not more. Broadcasting the trial in this case will clearly advance that interest. And so for the reasons set forth, the media, all of us, request that you enter an order, Judge Chutkin, permitting the live broadcast of this courtroom. Alternatively, broadcast it on YouTube or give us the hard files at the end of the day. We ask that you do this, signed your friend Chad Bowman on behalf of all of the people in the media. Now, we just got an order from the judge. She says, all right, Trump, if you have a position on this, let us know. Said here that all the defendants, defendant combined response says, if the media coalition's application, if any, okay, so Trump doesn't have to respond, but the combined response, if any, to their motion shall be due. It's due by November 10th, let us know. And so the question to you is one, is Trump going to respond? And two, if he does, what is his position going to be? 
And is his position going to be cameras in the courtroom? Which I think he will. That would be my take. I think he'll respond and he'll say cameras in the courtroom. We'll see. Next Ant question for prediction time. Judge Chutkin, what is she going to do? Is she going to grant it? Grant cameras in the courtroom. And if not, why not? And I say the answer is no. She's going to say historical tradition. She's going to say it involves classified documents. She's going to say it's necessary for safety and security and to protect everybody. And she's going to say that it's done to protect the integrity of the proceedings. That's what it's going to be for. Predictions. We'll see. Drop yours in the predictions and we'll see what she says, what she does. Now, here is a clip from Weissman. Now, what he's saying here is mirroring a lot of what we've been talking about, that Donald Trump is goading, okay? He's exercising maximum wingspan of his free speech rights to really, you know, maybe try to, 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 to goad the other side into doing something. And this was a wild exchange. Listen to these people on MSNBC. We'll see how much we can get through here. Well, Andrew Weissman, deal with this this specter of prison time with you. I mean, this case doesn't represent the threat of incarceration for Donald Trump. They're talking about New York. She's upset that he's not going to prison for this. The Mar-a-Lago documents case, yes. Georgia, Rico, yes. Jack Smith's election interference case before Judge Tony Chuckin, yes. But this one, and, and as everyone has said, he, he, the, he's already been found guilty of fraud. This is about assessing the punishment, the damages for that conclusion, but it doesn't hold any risk of jail time unless, unless, in the words of, of Judge Ngoron, Trump continues to defy this very narrow gag order to not threaten, malign, intimidate, and endanger the safety of his clerks. What is wrong with someone who is basically running through the, the, the red flag, I guess, being waved in front of him? He's exercising his free speech against a political partisan prosecution. That's all you can do. That's why we have the First Amendment, but these people don't understand the Constitution at all. Uh, I think I'm going to channel uh, Neil Kochel here because I think this is what's going on. Uh, you have a day that, as Lisa said, should have been simply about civil liability where Michael Cohen on the stand made um, admissions that are very damaging to his credibility. Yeah. Obviously, he, he said the I'm judge alive. is the ultimate decider yeah. what to believe, yeah. any or all or none of what he said. But he made very uh, serious admissions about his having lied uh, to uh, in the Senate, in Senate uh, interviews and in federal court, uh, not once, but twice to Judge Polly when he Oops. pled guilty. So this could have been a day where there were just legitimate references to um, undermine his credibility and in very, very serious ways um, that uh, you could have taken that route. Now, instead, this is, I think, a very deliberate strategy. Um, and as the judge found, it was palpable that this was a reference to the law clerk not to Michael Cohen, where Trump is, I think, deliberately playing to his base and goading the judicial system as part of a strategy um, in terms of his base, in terms of his political campaign and, and playing the victim. So I think this- Okay, so a bunch of this stuff can be too, true at the same time. So Trump can be flexing his free speech. And I think he should, because th th this is gonna cause a real division that I think only the Supreme Court can rectify. Where does Trump's free speech end? Where does the criminal court begin? And who can override whom in the middle of an election where we all wanna hear about the weaponization of the Justice Department? So Trump absolutely can do that. And I do think that part of Trump's strategy is that, okay? And I think it's a good strategy, Sort of, because he could also get himself in a lot of trouble. But if he's running in an election, he has to talk about it. I mean, he kind of doesn't have a choice but to talk about it. Trump can't just say, yes, I'm going to go along and get along and not cause a ruckus, not draw attention and energy to this case. They're, they would love it if Trump just shut up. 
and they could just prosecute him, convict him with a felony, use the conviction of the felony to send over to the different secretaries of state, say, see, we got a conviction. Now you can remove him off of the different ballots under the execution of the 14th Amendment removal clause, insurrection clause. All of that can be true. Now, I don't know, the, the, the reverse of this can also be true, that the judge is waiting for Trump to step on something so that he can just lash right into him, right? Now, the statement, Trump, was ambiguous. He said he was referring to the person sitting alongside the judge, and Michael Cohen was up on the stand. And so Trump and his defense, and Weissman brings this up, this is his own point, that Trump and his defense just crushed Michael Cohen, okay? We were hearing from Alina Abba and her brilliant, incredible cross-examination and backhanding of Michael Cohen in courtroom, got him to admit, as Weissman said multiple times, dude's a liar, convicted liar, and then got him to change his testimony because he probably broke the law again by admitting he lied to Congress again. And so the point is, is that the new sanction is the judge responding to a very bad day in court for Tish. okay? Trump's defense just had a huge victory. So the judge needs to find something to smash that away. What does he find? Oh, an AP article. Some AP reporter writes something, calls Trump to the stand. Trump just had this major victory, but now not so much. Now he's sanctioned with another fine, $10,000, right? And we've talked about this here, but how they parlay off of one another. So now then Chutkin will get another order and the other order will say, you know, or there'll be another motion saying Trump is saying this thing and the New York court is doing this. That's why you should do this judge. And then New York will say, well, look what they're doing in DC and you should do this here. And they just keep piggybacking off one another. So this is the game that they are playing. We will continue to cover to see what the ruling ultimately looks like on media access. And then Jack Smith is going to respond to the classified materials being used right now. We're going to have to put ride guardrails and what can we say? And we're going to have a bunch of new hearings about this. And so it's going to be a lot of fun, my friends. Now we're going to continue to cover this as in as much depth as we possibly can. So be sure you're subscribed. Thank you for sharing it with a friend or family member to invite them on over here to join us. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right. Now, my friends, we're not done here. We've got another nice filing to jump into and we're sticking with January 6th stuff in Chutkin's courtroom now, and let's get right to it. Donald Trump's defense issues the final reply in the battle over presidential immunity. Trump's team submitted this some time ago, and they told Judge Chutkin, as the president, it comes with certain privileges and immunities, which means that Trump cannot be prosecuted for doing things that were in the confines of his job as the executive of the country. And so he submitted the motion, and it was a nice one, a big one, we covered it here, Certainly encourage you to start there if you want to watch the background on this. But then, as we know, in Trump's motion to dismiss, it's not the final word the first time. Jack Smith gets the opportunity to respond, and then Trump gets the final say. It's kind of like a sandwich. Trump goes first, Jack Smith goes second, Trump gets the final word. And so we're going to take a look at Trump's final word, which is called the reply on this immunity issue, because Trump says it's such a big issue, the entire case should be dismissed because of Trump's status as the president. And so we'll go into that. Now, I want to share with you that the Jack Smith motion is available on the mind map. You can sign up for the mind map at robertgovea.com if you want to read the full thing and access it on our website at robertgovea.com when it is published. But I want to just show you and hit the highlights of it. And we'll fast forward to Trump's reply, which will incorporate a lot of this because he's responding to it. So here you can see it was a big one. 54 pages. This is from Jack Smith, the so-called special counsel. He is special. Here, the government's response in opposition to Trump's motion to dismiss the whole case on immunity, presidential immunity grounds. Now you can see, it says a former president has no immunity from federal criminal prosecution. No constitutional provision or historical practice supports this saying that the other civil liability that we saw in another companion case doesn't apply. Here, we would be creating novel immunity and that even if Trump were entitled to immunity, it would not be warranting a dismissal in this case, right? And so it's a big, long filing. You can see all the cases and it's all here. And because the the Trump reply will incorporate a lot of it, we're going to fast forward and start there. This is what Trump says. This is the final word before it lands on Judge Chutkin's desk. Trump's defense says, 
Your Honor, this is Trump's reply in support of his motion to dismiss based on presidential immunity, saying the following. Your Honor, Judge Shutkin, the question of presidential immunity is a weighty one. Intertwined with fundamental issues regarding our Constitution's structure, our history, and traditions and the president's unique role as the leader of our country. Although not yet resolved by the Supreme Court or any court, because all prosecutors until now have respected presidential immunity, that's why we haven't had to deal with this before, the legal underpinnings and the need for such protections are manifest. They're evident, self-evident. As the Supreme Court held in Nixon versus Fitzgerald, the civil liability case, the president must have the ability to make decisive and often unpopular decisions regarding matters of public concern. Just as he cannot be constrained by fear of civil lawsuits, like we saw in the prior case, so too should the president be protected from the much more potent specter of criminal prosecution by people like Big Fanny and Tish. To hold otherwise would require the president to hesitate at every turn Conscience, conscious of the very real threat that one of many hundreds of prosecutors around the country may one day question and file charges and seek to imprison him for his actions as president. Nor would recognizing criminal immunity actually place the president above the law, as the prosecution claims. Rather, it would return us to the sensible process envisioned by the founders, where the people's representatives in Congress, not an unelected prosecutor, first decide whether a president's official actions are worthy of sanctions and potential criminal liability. That has not occurred. And in fact, the Senate acquitted President Trump of charges formed from the same basis as this indictment. And so accordingly, Your Honor, the court should hold that President Trump is immune from criminal prosecution for the act described in the indictment and dismiss this case with prejudice, meaning it is not coming back. Don't even try it. And what they're talking about is the political process for trying a president accused of wrongdoing, right? High crimes, treason, high crimes and misdemeanors. So you go through the process and the people in the Senate, the, the elected senators, they kind of get to act as America's jury, right? Evidence is presented and they get to vote because it's kind of a, we have a concern that maybe it's criminal, but maybe it's political and we don't want political prosecution. So we leave a poli what could be a political prosecution to a political body. If they say, yep, it was criminal, it'll be overwhelming. They'll convict him, put him out of the political process, back into the civilian process and prosecute accordingly. But that's not what's happened here. They have actually acquitted Trump and they've prosecuted him anyways, four times. They say, Chutkin, the prosecution here, Jack Smith, the range thugs over there, says that they argue that presidential immunity does not extend to criminal prosecution of a president for his official acts. But the prosecution is wrong. First, the prosecution argues that recognizing immunity from criminal prosecution would place the president, quote, above the law. But they say, no, that's not true. As the prosecution recognizes, the president is subject to criminal prosecution for one, unofficial conduct or purely private acts. If he did something like went out on Fifth Street and blasted somebody, that, that's not in the confines of presidential duties. Or two, conduct within the scope of his official responsibilities, provided that he's first impeached by the House and convicted by the Senate. So he's not, in fact, above the law at all. The impeachment judgment clause in the Constitution, states that after a trial in the Senate, quote, the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. It's in the Constitution. The clause authorizes the prosecution of a president for conduct that was committed while in office if he is first, quote, convicted in the Senate. You go through the political protection process first, then you can go into the actual indictment in the civilian regular criminal justice system. They give us some historical examples telling us about Alexander Hamilton. They say, Your Honor, Chutkin, the historical authorities 
that were cited by the prosecution, they actually contemplate this same sequence, right? In other words, they've told you what I just told you in their own filings. For example, they quote Hamilton in Federalist number 65. He said when he wrote back then, quote, after, after having been sentenced to a perpetual ostracism from the esteem and confidence and honors and emoluments of this country through impeachment and conviction by the Senate, okay, impeachment and conviction after he will still be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of the law. And the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers were documents that our founders were sending and publishing to debate the creation of the Constitution and the founding of the country. So they looked to them to say, well, when they were writing the Constitution, what did they mean? Alexander Hamilton said that after you can then prosecute. So recognizing even then that presidential immunity from criminal prosecution, therefore, does not in fact place a president, quote, above the law because he can still be prosecuted. There are still modalities to get to him or her that he may never be prosecuted for official acts. It's not true. There's two mechanisms by which it can happen. Instead, it affirms that the careful safeguards the framers erected around the presidency were done for the pr public good. And it ensures that only Congress, only the people's representatives, may decide when and whether the president shall be liable to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. He was not convicted in the Senate, therefore he is immune from other prosecutions for that conduct. Now they say the text of the Constitution requires presidential immunity. Just read it. The prosecution next says, Jack Smith, that immunity cannot lie because no provision of the Constitution explicitly grants it. Saying it's not written in there though. This again is incorrect. As an initial matter, even absent specific textual support, the Supreme Court has recognized repeatedly broad immunity doctrines, including judicial immunity and the president's absolute civil immunity before. They found that, that the civil immunity exists and there's no specific textual basis in there for that one. Thus, the absence of a specific, quote, presidential immunity clause is not determinative, okay? Supreme Court already got around that one. Nice try. Rather, the court must look to the text of the Constitution in conjunction with the policies and the principles that are implicit in the office and then make a decision on the basis of that. Regardless, the text of the Constitution, namely the impeachment judgment clause, straightforwardly supports presidential immunity absent conviction in the Senate. The clause provides that the party convicted, convicted with an ED at the end, shall nevertheless then be liable. So the most natural interpretation of that is what it says, that a convicted party is then liable to criminal prosecution. Thus, a president who is not convicted is not liable. Oh my gosh, hopefully they're following this over there at the DOJ. I'm not sure. Maybe the highlighter girl should get out her highlighters and diagram this out on a whiteboard. The prosecution attempts to evade this clear language by arguing that that clause in referencing criminal prosecution after conviction of the Senate somehow strips the president of criminal immunity, regardless of the Senate's decision. They say, but this argument flips the plain text of the Constitution on its head. They say that, let's continue. Indeed, if the prosecution were correct, the phrase party convicted would be rendered a nullity. The president would be charged under any circumstance. That's clearly incorrect. You can see Marbury versus Madison about that. Historical authorities, including those cited by the prosecution, support the interpretation that a Senate conviction is a prerequisite for criminal prosecution. Alexander Hamilton said the same thing. The president of the United States would be liable to be impeached, tried, and upon conviction, removed from office and would afterwards be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of the law. So he said it again in 69, Federal 69. Now the word afterwards, the prosecution leaves out of its brief. Oh, they don't want to talk about that. They then instead know it would be incongruous and strained to have presidential immunity. 
but they say no. The Constitution is designed for this. The requirement of impeachment and conviction by the Senate assures that a president can be held criminally responsible for actions in his office, but only if there is broad political consensus to do so. That's why two houses of Congress, including a supermajority of the senators, are required. But once the charges of the president have been tested through this, and if they have been found to have been meritorious, then you can treat the former president on the same footing as the other citizens. Because it has been, we've been proven that it is not political. It's not political because we know that the president's own party, the president's own people, found through a supermajority that he was guilty of the thing. Then you can kick him out. Okay, it's not politics. Everybody agrees. Now go convict him. But consistent with this, the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized that the primary check on a president's wrongdoing is impeachment. Fitzgerald, the other case, said that itself. Therefore, the fact that some presidents remain immune from prosecution because they were never impeached is not a yawning impunity gap. And they continue. They say the prosecution finally speculates. And so we'll fast forward through that. And let's, let's, let's see what else they have here. They give us some historical precedent. They say a lot of other history supports this, okay? It's not only Alexander Hamilton. A lot of other people. He, he used the word subsequent, a subsequent prosecution in Federalist number 77. The prosecution also relies on an Aaron Burr statement. And the government is also citing some other cases. But here, prosecuting President Trump breaches centuries. Now, this is, I think, an interesting point. Centuries of unbroken tradition, because they are breaking glass in case of emergency. Here, the government argues that the fact that no former president has been criminally prosecuted reflects not a history and tradition implying the existence of criminal immunity, but the fact that other presidents just haven't been bad as Trump. On the contrary, American history teems with situations where the opposing party vigorously contended that a sitting president acted criminally in their official duties. But it only took until 2023 until the Democrats did this. Okay, they all did it. We've never had a president before that the other side says broke the law ever until Trump showed up. Are you serious? Deluded psychos. So for example, in the 1824 election, Andrew Jackson supporters accused John Quincy Adams of affecting a corrupt bargain with Henry Clay when they appointed him Secretary of State in, in exchange of using his influence to deliver the election to Adams. So, in other words, John Quincy Adams brought somebody in, appointed them after they delivered the votes in the House because it was contested. So in the 1876 election, President Grant dispatched federal troops to disputed states to ensure that Republican-controlled canvassing committees could organize just enough pro-Republican slates of electors to elect Ruther Bird B. Hayes after Hayes lost the popular vote. Nixon was widely accused of criminal obstruction of justice for Saturday night massacres and the Watergate special prosecutor firing. Bush his critics widely accused him of lying to Congress to induce the Iraq war, getting us into Saddam Hussein. Obama was criticized for personally authorizing the extrajudicial killing of a United States citizen through a CIA kill list and a drone strike that killed the citizen and his 16-year-old son, another U.S. citizen. American history provides further examples of this. A lot of criminal conduct. Can you charge Obama with murder? Though many at the time believed these official actions were criminal and their political opponents eventually took power in every case, none of these presidents were ever charged with a crime for their official acts. Our history reflects a strong tradition against prosecuting presidents for their official acts until Trump. But they say that Trump is just the worst. The president's absence, okay, a lot of other people have been prosecuted. But the presidency's absence for the list, mayors, sheriffs, governors, VPs, cabinets, they've all been prosecuted, but not presidents. Why? Immunity. They say, 
that Fitzgerald actually supports their claim. And this is the civil case. They say the reasoning of Fitzgerald is very similar here. And it also supports finding criminal immunity in this case. So it applied civilly when Nixon was being sued. So why it should apply here. A president must be able to pursue his duties and they are sensitive and far reaching. So if we allow the president to be prosecuted for everything, he won't be able to do his job. Very other similar immunity doctrines are also similar. Like a judge cannot be criminally liable in certain contexts. We have other types of immunity like qualified immunity and so on. There are already adequate safeguards here. The president can be prosecuted in other contexts. And here, all the things that Trump did are immune. So we've been talking about this outer perimeter test, right? There's some conduct that Trump is involved in that is clearly within the presidency's duties. There's some conduct that is clearly outside of the president's duties. And then there's probably some stuff that's kind of right there in the middle. Borderline. So they say, Your Honor, unable to deny that the vast majority of Trump's alleged conducts, which was within the outer perimeter of his duties, the prosecution does not even try. Instead, it devotes the bulk of its brief to arguing that Trump's criminal immunity does not exist, or it should apply with less force than the other case. The prosecution, though, presents no argument at all about most of their allegations, apparently conceding that they would meet the Fitzgerald test, consistent with the appropriately broad duties of the presidency. So the few remaining arguments are meriless. And so these allegations have all been characterized properly. And organizing alternative slates of electors is immune. Some of Trump's conduct, they say, was purely private, but they say no. Here, organizing alternative slates of electors is immune and it's presidential conduct in itself. And preparatory to the immune presidential conduct of communicating with Congress about the certification proceedings. They say the president, first, organizing slates of electors is within the rights and duties. It comes literally out of the Constitution and that's what the president enforces. History confirms that the organizing alternate slates of electors are within the presidential duties because President Grant himself was directly involved in and supported the slates of Republican electors back in 1867. In that election, both sides declared fraud. President Grant directly supported Republican efforts to organize alternate slates of electors and nobody prosecuted him for it. These were presidential acts and they reflected Grant's direct involvement in the organizing slates of electors that he viewed as fraud. They say, accordingly, based on all of this, Your Honor, presidential immunity applies, and this case should be dismissed with prejudice. Signed by your friends, John Loro and Todd Blanche, over from the Trump defense team. And man, they have just so many different motions to dismiss filed right now. Judge Chutkin and Jack Smith, they're getting all these new filings every day. Motions to dismiss for constitutional violations, for statutory violations, vindictive and selective prosecution, and of course, presidential immunity as well. And my thought is on all of these that they're all going to be denied. All right. It's Judge Chutkin we're talking about. We're talking about the District of Columbia. But... When Trump loses these, we're going to have an issue of, a, of collateral consequences, right? External consequences. Trump may be filing interlocutory appeals saying, Your Honor, I cannot wait to appeal this until the conclusion of my criminal case here. Why? Because I will lose my election time. I will lose all of this time and it will impact my political rights, my First Amendment rights and all of these other rights. And so we're going to see that these motions to dismiss are coming in as anchors just to etch in stone and to make the record clear that Trump is a victim of all sorts of egregious violations. And then Trump and his team will respond in time.
Now, what's interesting about this is all of these motions to dismiss are all showing all of the various violations that we're sitting here witnessing are coming from Trump's political opponents, okay? In other words, Trump is the victim of a political onslaught. Four different criminal charges, all filed right in the same year so that they all climax right in the middle of an election season, orchestrated in various states, civil lawsuits brought by Bergdorf's and by Tisch and others, right? It is an orchestrated attack on the guy. But what's funny is they're all freaked out that if Trump wins and he continues to go up in the polls, every time they indict him, every time there's a new problem, he does better. But they're saying Trump, when he gets in office, he's going to all be about retribution. What do you think Trump would be like as president in 20, if he wins in 24? Well, he's already saying it's going to be about retribution. And he's, you know, he's a very petty man. And, it, and it's all about him. Um, and... Uh, he, he he's a very has a very fragile ego, and you know something happened to him as a kid. And I'm not going to spend time psychoanalyzing it, but <laughs> you know every encounter he has to come out showing the other guy that he's better. It's all about you know the assertion of his ego, and uh, I think he will be self indulgent uh, in a new administration. And good. Um, you know, won't be as effective as he could otherwise be. And probably uh, things would start moving toward chaos. Oh yeah, chaos for what? The DOJ? Chaos for what? The FBI or your cronies who all have been prosecuting Trump and orchestrating this attack? Well, that's what we're kind of looking for. We're looking for some retribution because what is being done to him is not appropriate. And if they're gonna break glass in case of emergency and start prosecuting their political enemies, Trump has every right to hop in the office and do the same thing. And so, of course, we'll be here continuing to cover, my friends. I hope you join us. Thank you for subscribing to our channel. Thank you for checking out robertgovea.com. We've got a daily newsletter there that goes out where all of these videos are summarized. So in case you miss the show, in case you miss a full segment, you get them delivered to your inbox. We'd love it if you forwarded it to somebody. But if not, just delete it. No problem at all. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, now. We've got one final segment left, and then we'll hear from you, my friends. But let's see what we've got in store today. Congress demands answers about that big $200,000 check that ended up in Joe Biden's bank account that came over from his brother, James Biden. We saw this one sent over March 1st, 2018 for a loan repayment, whatever that was, from Sarah and James Biden Sr., over to Joseph R. Biden Jr., $200,000. Well, that's a big one. And now Comer, who's on the Oversight Committee, is demanding answers. He sent one letter over to the White House Counsel, and we're gonna go through that. It's not too long, but he says, hey, you know, we learned about this $200,000. Do you have any idea where it came from? And he also sent a letter over to Jamie Raskin, saying, Jamie, you said a lot of mean things about us in Congress. You said that we had no evidence. Well, now we've got a big fat check with James Biden and Joe Biden's names on it. Is that good enough for you, Jamie? So we'll see what Oversight said to Raskin as well. But let's start off with Comer giving us a breakdown on what is happening here. You might need to get uh, the President of the United States to turn over those loan documents. Are you looking at that as a possibility? Yes, we've already called for the President uh, to release the terms of the so-called loan that he apparently claims he made to his brother. But look, whether or not he made it alone is irrelevant. What matters is Joe Biden benefited to the tune of $200,000 from this. Either he made a loan to his brother, like they claim, which I don't believe, but let's say they pull something out of their rear end, John, and say they made a loan to his brother for $200,000. His brother could not have paid that loan back without influence peddling the company That's AmeriCorps right. Health out of $200,000. We have Jim Biden's bank records, and I can say with 100% confidence that uh, he had very little money in that checking account for, for a long time. And the only way he could have paid that back was with that $200,000 payment. So either Joe Biden was paid $200,000 as part of the influence peddling scheme, payback, kickback, dividend, whatever you want to call it, or Joe Biden actually made a loan to his brother and because his brother influenced peddled AmeriCorps Health, 
he paid him back $200,000. So either Joe Biden made $200,000 or he didn't lose $200,000. Either way, Joe Biden's $200,000 better off today because of his family's influence peddling scheme. And like everything else, John, we know that Joe Biden met the CEO of AmeriCorps Health. We know that Jim Biden uh, made a pitch to AmeriCorps Health that he could help them get all sorts of money from the Middle East through his brother's contacts in the Middle East. This is classic influence peddling 101, and Joe Biden, as, uh, as is always the case, was front and center in this, but this time we have the hard evidence that he benefited to the tune of $200,000. Woo, all right, so there we go. And I think that's a good point. You know, James Biden didn't have any real job. Like, what was he doing? What was, what, where did he get the $200,000 or the $600,000 for from? Nowhere. Same as Hunter. The only asset these guys had was Joe, Sleepy Joe, and the promise that they could do something trading on the family's name. So this is what Comer sent over to the White House. It comes over from the Oversight Committee. James Comer from Kentucky. He says, all right, White House Counsel Edward Siskel. Dear Mr. Siskel, the Committee on Oversight and Accountability, James Comer, has been investigating the Biden family's influence peddling schemes. Now, as part of this investigation, the committee obtained bank records related to Biden's brother and sister-in-law, James and Sarah Biden, and an entity associated with them. Now, according to these bank records, Joe got 200K from James Biden dated on March 1st, the check that we've seen. James Biden issued a check from his personal bank account the same day he received the 200,000 from AmeriCorps a company going through bankruptcy proceedings to which James Biden made, quote, representations that his last name Biden could, quote, open doors and that he could obtain a large investment from the Middle East based on his political connections. And that was from a bankruptcy filing that we read through here, the full thing in detail previously. Now, the White House has claimed Joe Biden loaned Biden, James Biden, 200 grand. And this check was just repayment. That's what Ian Sams posted. Ian Sams is that, you know, interesting fella over on the X platform. So he says, oh no, it was just repayment. But records obtained by the committee do show numerous large incoming transactions into the personal bank accounts of James and Sarah Biden from various entities. Some of these transaction records may have obscured the identity of the true payer, but no records in the committee's possession state that Joe Biden made a large loan payment to his brother. So it's all new. We've got James and Sarah's records and there's nothing in there that says we got 200 grand from Joe. So they say White House, if Joe Biden did personally loan James his bro an amount that was later repaid by $200,000, can you please provide the loan documents, including the loan payment, the loan agreement, and any other supporting loan documentation that you have? As you know, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Code, has specific requirements for delineating and reporting, quote, below market rate loans from gifts. Now, while there are some exceptions, for example, loans of $10,000 or less, the payment in question would not appear to be exempt from such requirements if it is a loan. Indeed, there appears to have been no interest paid on this so-called loan based on the White House's own representations. And so the current lack of documentation leaves reason to doubt that claims that this transaction was in fact repayment for a legal loan. Comer says, therefore, we request documentation clarifying the nature of this payment and whether all applicable documentation and IRS filings were properly made. And now whether this is a loan or not, James Biden's check to Joe Biden aptly demonstrated that he personally benefited from his family's shady influence peddling of his name and access. And even if the transaction in question was part of a loan agreement, we are troubled that Joe Biden's ability to recoup funds depended on his brothers cashing in on the Biden brand. We've got authority to investigate all this, so give us some answers on it. Sincerely, your friend, James Comer, over on the Oversight Committee. And so that goes over to the White House Counsel. Now, they're obviously not gonna respond to that at all. They're gonna, he's private, you know, man, he's 2018. And he's a private citizen, and his brother's a private citizen, and all this is just a coincidence, okay? Raskin and others will still say, there is no evidence out there. But Raskin is also getting a letter from Comer and a bunch of other Congress people. Check this out. They're all mad at him. Watch. 
Comer is here. Grothman's here. We've got Pete Sessions, Nancy Mace, Lisa McLean, no relation to John. Pat Frillin, Michael Turner, Paul Gosar, Gary Palmer, Virginia Fox, Clay Higgins, Andy Biggs from Arizona, shout out. Jake LaTurner, Byron Donald's in the house. Look at all these people. Marjorie's on the list. Anna Paula Luna, Bobert's on the list. Eric Burleson and others. Man, they are not happy with Raskin. Oh boy, let's see what this letter says. It says, hey, Raskin, honorable. Pfft. As you're aware, the Oversight Committee is investigating Biden's connections to his family and in international schemes. And to date, the committee has demonstrated that Joe Biden lied to the American people in 2020 about his family getting money from China. We now know that's true. Joe also lied about bank records, clearly, clearly showing money originating from foreign sources and going to his fam, and failed to disclose his own knowledge about the family participating in businesses with Romania, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Russia, and China, phone calls, dinners, meetings with business associates, and so on. And most recently, the committee has shown that a payment by James Biden, the president's brother to Joe, totaling $200,000 exists. Thus, Raskin, Jamie, showing definitively that Joe Biden has in fact benefited from, from his family's influence peddling and his shady business activities. Now, in the first 10 months of the Republican majority, the committee has made great strides in revealing the truth about how Biden put America last and his family first. But, Jamie, in the course of this investigation, you have been a spirited critic of the need to look into Biden and his family. It's, of course, your prerogative to determine how best to serve your constituents. Abe Lowell and the American people. Oh! That's a zinger right there. Yeah, right there. Ugh. Hey, Jamie. Yeah, you can do whatever you want to serve your constituents. You know, and Abbe Lowell, Abby Lowell also. Do you know who that is? Hunter's lawyer. Jamie working for Hunter's lawyer. Now, however, the oversight committee must not be used as a means to propagate false or deceptive information. And for that purpose, we must address public statements you made, Jamie, that are contradictory, contradicts facts, and are unfortunately lies. Jamie lied to us, according to Congress. I believe it. They say, pursuant to a committee subpoena that was issued on May 3rd, the FBI on June 5th produced an unclassified FD-1023 document to the committee that detailed an alleged bribery scheme between Joe and his son, Hunty, as reported to a CHS, a confidential source called Mikola. The FBI also provided a briefing to Chairman Comer, who's one of the authors of this letter, to Jamie Raskin and to others. Now the American people have rightfully since it's been given the opportunity to review this document for themselves here. But after the briefing, Jamie, we covered this live, you rushed to the cameras outside the briefing room and said, what I know is that the FBI, the DOJ team under William Barr, Scott Brady in the Western part, District of Pennsylvania, they terminated the investigation. They said that there were no grounds for further investigative steps. And we covered that here. I don't know if it was live, but it was like back to back. And somebody else came out and said, uh, are you sure, Jamie? Because somebody else said that's not true. Now this week, the committee on the, on the judiciary conducted a transcribed interview of the former U.S. attorney from Pennsylvania. The guy's name is Scott Brady. When asked about your characterization of his team's work, he said, my understanding of Raskin's public statement is that, based on the determination that I and my team found, the allegations in the 1023 not credible or other information not credible, we did not escalate the assessment to a limited or full investigation. He said, my understanding of Raskin's public statement is that, this is what Raskin said, that he said that we didn't make a determination, we did not escalate that. Mr. Brady, is what Raskin said true about you? He said, no, it was not true. After directly refuting your characterization, Jamie, he added his team did find that there was sufficient, quote, indicia of credibility 
in this 1023 to pass it on to an office that had a predicated grand jury investigation. Amazing. So Jamie lied to all of us. Shock. Big whoop. Now, the committee requests that you formally correct the record, Jamie, and apologize to the American people for spreading disinformation about the evidence that was collected by this committee. Additionally, we ask Mr. Raskin that you take seriously your position as ranking member on our committee and you be honest about the facts learned in our investigations, even those that are inconvenient to you in your own political views. And while we appreciate your role up to this point to play defense counsel for Biden, it's now time to follow the evidence and speak the truth. Jamie, liar. Sincerely, your friends over in Congress, around the corner, James Comer, Glenn Grothman, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lisa McLean, and others. All right, so that, my friends, is what's happening in Congress. They're starting to get a little uh, agitated with each other, rightfully so. Nobody wants liars in Congress, especially Jamie Raskin liars. And so we'll see if Comer and the Oversight Committee can get any answers out of this from these people. And of course, my friends, we're going to continue to cover it until we do. I hope you join us as we go along on this wild ride. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for checking out robertgovea.com to sign up for our daily newsletter where all this good stuff will be delivered right to your email inbox. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friends. Well, that is it on the day. We covered some good ground. $200,000 checks flying around the Biden family, whatever that's for. Trump doubling down on presidential immunity in his final reply. We've got classified materials, classified evidence is going to be used in the trial in March. And we are looking forward to that, my friends. It was a busy one. But now it's time to hear from you and to see what you have to say about all of this from our friends. We're going to check out watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We're checking out YouTube. We're saying what's up to the Rumbles. And we're starting the day off with our friend B-Man over on the YouTubes. Of course, after the show, we're going to go over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. We'd love to see you there. We also do member streams in the morning on Saturdays. And so members, we'll see you there tomorrow. That's from uh, me. This is from B-Man. Says, nary a word about Ray Epps or Hunty B. Well, we've talked a lot about Ray Epps here. I don't know that there's anything new on Ray Epps. He took a plea deal and that was kind of the end of it. And then Hunter, well, we talked about the Biden crime family today. So I'm not sure who you're talking about, B-Man, whether that's somebody else out there, unless we're missing some new Ray Epps stuff. But Hunter, you know, Hunter's well involved in the Biden crime family stuff. So we did get a little bit of that here today. But you may have sent that before we talked about it. So anyways, thank you, B-Man, for swinging by. Thank you for the dono. And I'm trying to think where else that comment might fit. But anyways, thank you. DT's here. What's up as a supporter? Welcome aboard. DT in the house as a supporter. All YouTube friends, make sure you grab the Telegram link. Navigate over to the Community tab section. Grab the Telegram link. And we'll see you in there. Tony Lee also became a supporter. Same thing goes to you, Tony. Welcome. Glad you're a supporter. And we're looking forward to seeing you on our Saturday stream. Dolphin fan is the man bringing in five new membos. Just my opinion. Coco Hull. Magoose is here. Brad T and Raul R. All coming in courtesy of Dolphin fan is the man bringing in new membos. Bringing in new membos. Thank you, Dolphin. Appreciate you being here. And Trump gal for life says, I love your work. Peace from Houston. Uh, peace from Phoenix, Trump gal for life. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for the prayers, the flag, and the heart. And, you know, I haven't been to Houston in a long time, man. I, I visited a friend in Houston maybe 10 years ago. I had a great time. I had a great time. Good to see you, Trump gal. Hey, Grifty's in the house. Four months. Whoa, a member for four months. Found out wife is prego from Grifties in the house. Have three sons now. Team Pink. So congratulations, Grifty. The wife's pregnant. So congratulations to Grifty and the Grifty wife and the Grifty household. Three sons in tow. It's a good number. Three boys. Strong. 
you know, you can start a nice little team of something over there. All right. So thank you for being a membo, Grifty, for four months. And your membership is almost halfway to a baby as well. We got Justin. Welcome aboard, Justin. First super chat from Justin in the house says here, happy Friday, Rob. I really like your points the other day about how limiting the House of Representatives member count undermines the people. Also, the speaker voting no on banning BPA in children items is a huge L. Oh, is that real? I did not know that. Yeah, we're learning a lot more about this Mike Johnson fella as we go through his record, and I did not know that, or whatever the justification is for that. But, uh... Is it a plastic, I mean, is it a plastics thing? Is that, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the issue, I don't know what that issue is about. But I do know that Justin, you were around when we talked about limiting. So we talked about on our members only stream about how the Senate and the House of Representatives are not in total alignment. Well, at least the House of Representatives with, with, with the original founding of the constitution. You know, we used to have like one representative per 70,000 people, which means your proportion of representation was much bigger than, than it is today. Now your representation is like one to 700,000 because the population is 300 million, but we still are stuck at 435 representatives. So it's just not much. And so it's, uh, and as 435 stays the same and it gets bigger, we lose our share of representation. So my thesis is we should go back to the original founding and have something like 5,000 or 7,000 House of Representative members. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but we talked through it and how it's easy to buy and control 535 people, 435 in the, in the House, 100 in the Senate. So if you had 5,000 people that was truly representative, I think you'd have a lot harder time with special interests gaining control, and a lot of the stuff that you don't need would never make it there because it's too much to manage, and you would never really be able to corrupt everybody. You'd have probably more parties. Anyways, we had a fun conversation about it. So uh, thanks, Justin. I, I, I thought it was an interesting conversation. And most people in, in the chat disagree with me, by the way. So it's fun. Knox is here. Says, TGIF all. Ugh, tell me about it, Knox. Says, yes, it would take a lot of pages to talk your way out of executive privilege. Sheesh. From Knox Beerman. Knox Beerman in the house. An attorney over in uh, Texas says the same thing. Alexander Hamilton. Another comment from Knox. That wacky right-wing terrorist. I know. Well, the founders, you know, the founders, I think if you say like 1776, you turn up on a watch list or something like that. You know, I don't know. Hey, John says, thank you, Knox. John McGarvey's over on Locals. Says, tip jar, totally worth it. Was John, were you dropping some, some bombs out there today? Effing this mother, effing son of a, you know, all the things. What's up, crisis at the border? Welcome aboard, crisis at the border. That is a, an accurate name, no doubt. Thanks for becoming a member. We got GSG McLovin is here, says, ha ha, that's hilarious. They put him on the pedestal. They put him on the pedestal. Trump on the stand? It's like putting Trump on the pedestal. Ada Ortega says, God bless Trump family and the legal team from Ada Ortega over on the tubes. Thank you, Ada. And this one's from Kaiser says, my idea of Trump retribution is assigning true nonpartisan prosecutors to do the work and he has to do his own work. Have a good afternoon, watchers. True nonpartisan prosecutors to do the work and he does his work. You mean like getting America back on track again? That would be nice. I think we're in political blood sports season here for a while. And if they're going to, we've talked about it. If they're going to kick you in the nads, you got to, it's fair game. Those are the rules. The rules change, you know, Rocky's here. What's up, Rocky over on local says happy Friday, Rob. And great stuff as always. My comment, Comer's $200,000 check to me is a bit underwhelming. They can explain that away all day long. What evidence needs to be shown is this is what policy actions did Biden take while VP or president in response to the enrichment? The fact that he received money isn't and in itself, in and of itself going to go anywhere, in my humble opinion. So like you want to see the other side of the equation. So like Rocky, like the Menendez case is a good example. Okay. Menendez got gold bars. Joe Biden got a $200,000 check. Menendez, we know that he made phone calls 
to try to get people off the criminal prosecution, right? U.S. attorneys were very uncomfortable about that. So you're saying, what was the action from Joe? And so my response would be, well, is, is your, like what, what threshold is that? Is, you know, bringing Hunter on foreign trips kind of a threshold? Is him going golfing with people? Is him showing up to meetings? Is that influence? Is that enough? Or do you want to see Joe Biden also making phone calls and stuff like that? We'll see. Yeah, it's a good point. There, 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 I'm sure is a lot more to come, but so we're not quite there on the check issue for you. That's fair. We've got this from MAGA hat says Bill Barr drips with disdain for Trump. Bill Barr, who covered up the Epstein murder, the Epstein list, didn't investigate voter registration schemes before 2020, didn't investigate after the election, covered for Joe Biden. Basically, he did nothing. He called the Ukraine call a boneheaded idea, shows contempt for Rudy. Things will be thrown into chaos as far as the three-letter agencies, and he may face some consequences himself. That's why they're a little bit nervous over there. Rachel Maddow's a little nervous, too. MAGA Hat says, Bill Barr is a snob, no doubt about it. Bodie says, so where are the videos that were promised? Talking about some J6 stuff, maybe? The J6 videos? I don't know. I think we're probably still waiting for those. What is up? Ada Ortega with another one. Thank you, Ada, for sending that one in. Very grateful for those. And Knox says, excellent shows all week, Robert. I would be so far behind if not for you. Thank you, Knox. Well, thanks for being a member over on Locals. And thanks for supporting us. And it's been a wild week, right? It's just been wild. Plea deals and things are really, really going fast now. So I'm glad that you're able to join us, Knox. And we're going to keep plugging along. So thanks for being here. Alan Harkins over on the Rumbles. What's up, Alan? He says, what an awesome news report. I am never let down here with you and your entourage. You are consistently wise, in the know, and fun. Bravo. Alan, thank you, Alan. Thanks for being a member on Rumble. Thanks for joining us. And for always being so helpful with your Rumble rants and contributing to the work that we do here. I'm grateful for you and your support and for your very nice comments when we do see you. So thanks for being here. Alan Harkin in the house. We got a bad poet says, I feel U.S. secrets are only secret from Americans. <laughs> That's kind of a good point. Yeah, like they, they won't even tell us about like the assassination of our own president. It's like, what? Okay, I guess we're too dumb to know what happened in our own country. What's up, Mountain Goddess? Says, great stream, nice to see them arms. Well, thank you, Mountain Goddess. It's nice to be here and have arms. I'm glad that I do have them. Thank you, Mountain Goddess. I'm, I'm grateful for you being here and for the nice compliment. We got Tanya Karras is here. Says, hi, just happy Friday, baby. And I'm with you on that, Tanya. It is a happy Friday. Thanks for the very nice tip. Thanks for being here and for celebrating the end of the busy week with us. What's up? We've got this one from Dolphin Fan. Says, hi, Rob and watchers. Tomorrow is opening day for hunting in my area. Hope I can catch you live the next few days. If not, I will see you guys next Thursday. Woo! Much love and blessings to all of you. Man, so Dolphin Fan, you're going out on a little excursion, huh? A little bit of a trip. So we'll miss you for most of the next week. Maybe, maybe you'll be able to catch us. But hopefully have a very safe trip and a very successful outing. And we'll be here when you get back, my friend. Be safe, be well, and best of luck to you out there. Hopefully you come back nice and rejuvenated with a good haul. All right, and so... Let's see what else. That was from Dolphin Fan is the man. And my friends, very nice, very generous donos. Thank you for sending those in and helping support all the things that we do here. Let's jump on over to the X platform and see who's over on the X joining us today. Oh my gosh. This is a record, everybody. We've got 51 people viewing over on the X platform. Elon is definitely out there. Hey, Elon, thanks for joining us. This is a new record. I don't think we've ever seen 51 at the end of the show. Hello to our Twitter friends. It's so ex friends. Sorry, Elon, don't ban me. Oh gosh, I almost got banned. So thank you, uh, Elon, for, uh, and all of our ex friends for joining us. It's an absolute, it's a Friday miracle. All right, let's see who's over here. <laughs> let's see who's over here. Uh, I can't even believe it. We've got Danny McWilliams saying, my brain hurts now. Thank you, Robert. That's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to do that. Danny McWilliams is here, 62 viewers at one point. We got the saddest thing for me from Fred. Says, the saddest thing for me and Johnny is when you're reading these motions, I sometimes forget which of the four trials it is. <laughs> so, 
by the way, so do I, Fred. There's so much going on. I'm like, you know, Tishy suing uh, uh, Fanny, suing Cohen. It's all just a big, just a big mess. We've got old drill sergeant says, as always, great stream today. Thank you, old drill sergeant. And says, thank you for taking Viva to school about the Georgia please. Wish more in the mainstream media would listen to you. And, you know, Viva had his take on it. But I think that it, it, feels, it feels like I'm being sneaky about it. You know, it feels like I'm being sneaky. Like, no, it's not technically a plea deal. It's actually a deferred adjudication. And like, I could sense with Viva, he still didn't really even believe me, you know? Like we showed the document on the screen and he's like, yeah, but I think you're just being kind of a sneaky lawyer. <laughs> it's like, no, it's what it says. So George says, great work as usual, Rob. And, and glad to see the house back to work, no doubt. And George is, is tagging Marjorie. Maybe Marjorie's watching us over on X. I don't know. Yeah, maybe she's watching us too. Out of control. All right, well, everybody left now. Okay, so 10 people left. So, as soon as I mentioned it, they're like, we're out of here. See ya. <laughs> show sucks. We're out of here. Nice job, Rob. We're never coming back unfollowed. All right, so there goes 10 people. And it's going down. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, and so, my friends, that is it for us on the day. Boy, oh boy, we are going to go over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our after party. And we would love to see you over there. We also do member streams on Saturdays. We do member streams in the morning. And we have a lot of fun. We have an awesome community. And we would love it if you joined us either on YouTube or on Locals or on Rumble. You can join us as a member there as well. We also have our website, robertgovea.com. You can get access to this whole mind map is over there. Show reports are there. PDFs are uploaded over there. And it's a great way to stay in touch in case something happens on YouTube. Sign up for the newsletter. It's a great way for us to stay in communicado. We also want to thank, before we wrap it up on the day, our mods and our meme smiths who help keep things nice and orderly today and all throughout the week. Big thanks to our friends, the Antiquist Prime, K-Bean in the house, Just Cause, Playin' Hooky, our friend Ronnie Cole, Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, Janak. We've got Dog Digger, Donut Mind Me, and John McGarvey, all modding down the fort for us, along with Sleepy Dog Lee, Jigum Geegum, and Nathan NA10 as our meme smiths who keep things nice and beautiful on the stream. But my friends, that is it for us. On the week, we covered a lot of ground. We had plea deals, motions to dismiss. We had trial settings. And I think we're just getting warmed up. We're going to have all of that and more next week. But until then, it is the weekend. And that's a good opportunity for us to get outside Get some sunshine, some vitamin D, unplug from all of this political and legal madness for a few short days, if we can, a little bit, and get some vitamin D, get some sunshine, get some fresh air, get that blood pumping, lift some heavy objects, spend time with the people that you love, your friends, your family, and everybody else in between, so that we can come back on Monday refreshed, rejuvenated, and ready to get right to it. And we need to see you right back here so that together, with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night and a beautiful weekend, my friends. I'll see you right back here on Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you.